Service All right, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Uh, we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, roll call, please. Kristen Cambenzi. Here. Glenn Sarka. James Hewitt. Here. Jennifer Cliff. Oh my goodness. Here. Jennifer Ray. Here. Cheryl Maddox Smith. Here. Jason Zadunit. Here. Okay, and I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda. We'll make a motion to approve the agenda. A second. Okay, motion made by Mr. Zadudnik, support by Mrs. Clip. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Um, moving on to the Making Democracy Work Award presentation. I would like to invite the League of Women Voters of Marquette. I'm Pre Burnham. I'm coordinator of voter services for the League of Women Voters of Marquette County. And I'm pleased to award our Making Democracy Work Award to the MAPS School Board. The Making Democracy Work Award was created by the League of Women Voters as a way to recognize and celebrate community members who demonstrate committed, visionary leadership that strengthens our democracy. This year, we're so pleased to present this award to the 2023-2024 Market Area Public School Board. We chose to honor the MAPS Board with this award because of their commitment to community engagement and transparency. During the past year's search for a new name and logo for the high school, among other issues on their agenda, the board sought input from and listened to the voices of community members, students, and one another and in the words of the Mining Journal's editorial, the board, quote, held true to its mission and process and saw the issue through to its conclusion. So uh, this is the award we handed out. We gave this out at our annual meeting, uh, but not all of the members were there. So I want to hand to those who were not there the cards that we just gave. And thank all of you for your service to the community. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, moving on to the superintendent's report. Good evening, board and audience. Appreciate you allowing me a few minutes to give an update. I will soon be inviting our student achievement coordinator, Kathleen Stiles, to join me at the podium. But before I do, just a quick preview. So, three years ago, I was part of a message. I was helping deliver a message regarding MTSS, multi-tiered systems of support. And MTSS was going to be the mechanism by which we address the impact of COVID-19. Later in the presentation, you'll see some data that, I guess, reinforces what that impact looks like. But it was pretty significant. I think significant is an appropriate term, being a former math teacher. and. When you look at MTSS, it was a fitting initiative to address a complex problem in a district this size with so many moving parts. MTSS, in, in essence, is a systematic approach to increasing student achievement, looking at the academic, the social, the emotional, the whole child, if you will. It's 
data driven, it's research based, it's very much best practice in education. It made sense that that be our, our focus for strategic pl planning, our focus for professional development, our focus for how we invest district finances, some of which you'll hear later in the presentation. And I'm excited tonight because we get to see a little bit of the fruit of our labor. And I think we have some data that reinforces the positive impact that this initiative has made. Would never happen, of course, without the dedication of a lot of amazing staff, dedicated community, and I want to be on record expressing my appreciation to the Board of Education as well, providing us the support to push forward with an initiative of this nature, to focus on something that ultimately will positively impact student achievement in a climate where there's a lot of distractions in public education and an attempt sometimes to use schools as uh, political theater for adult politics. It's nice to focus on something that we can agree upon. So anyway, quickly talking about some programming changes. I, I will not spend a lot of time on this particular slide, but I do want to highlight just a couple things. Most of this I've talked about with the board before. I, I do think it's worth noting that we are in week two of our summer enrichment program. Again, much thanks to Ms. Stiles for overseeing that program over, well, approximately 400 kids are currently coming to this building four days a week, four hours a day for academic enrichment, along with some fun activities, some fun classes, free breakfast and free lunch. And that's a six week program, one that I think has had a direct impact on student achievement. Very excited about our summer enrichment program. The NMU summer math, the summer math camp, otherwise known as Labs Unleashed, this is a brand new concept. We've partnered with Northern Michigan University. They have opened up the Jacob Betty Center and the impressive resources that are available there to all our regional students, particularly those that are focused on those in the high school or grades eight through eleven, and it's really application-based mathematics. It's hands-on learning. It's taking math concepts, bringing them into the labs, and learning how they apply to real-life scenarios. 51 of 60 students in that program come from maps. All for free. A little bit more about programming. I've talked, spoken to the board previously about our instructional coaches. Again, a significant investment. Our instructional coaches just there's six, actually six and a half. We have a half-time instructional coach right now at our alternative school as well. The instructional coaches play a pivotal role in helping facilitate PLCs, that's professional learning communities, implement MTSS, of course, address the social emotional needs of our students, use data to drive instruction, and look for best practice, pedagogical best practice, ultimately addressing whatever the students' needs are. So the instructional coaches, again, a significant investment by the board. I appreciate that once again. That was just one of the initiatives that we put in place, again, starting off the heels of COVID, addressing not just academic, but the social emotional needs. We also incorporated uh, full-time counselors in our, in our elementary schools. We now have five social workers throughout MAPS, including a full-time social worker at the alternative school, full-time social worker at the high school, and a full-time social worker at Bothwell. We went from two social workers to five. We have an autism behavior specialist. We have multiple supports in place at the building level as well. And I'll, I won't get into that just, just this, at this point in time. But it's, it's really amazing what we're doing with our programming. We're targeting specific needs of students. And I think we're starting to see, as, you'll, as you will see shortly, some improvement. Just a little bit more. We really target a lot of our resources at the early elementary level. Uh, the, the formative years are obviously very important. I think that our investment in those formative years are going to pay dividends over and over throughout their high school career. I'm looking forward to seeing the growth filter through the upper levels as those kids get older. I put some examples of some additional supports in place. I mentioned the early levels. JK in every building. This is the third year that we have JK in every building. They're full. The, the program is, I think, incredibly important for those students that aren't quite ready for the rigor of kindergarten. We have a kindergarten screener in place where our staff come and, and do, do a, essentially a, a, an assessment 
uh, work with the parents to determine whether or not their child should go into kindergarten or JK. And we have multiple supports, curriculum resources in place. We've done a lot with curriculum, done a lot with progress monitoring, all at the early elementary level, which I think has made a great impact. So at this time, as promised, I'd like to invite our student achievement coordinator, Ms. Kathleen Stiles. She's doing a great job, and I'm going to let her share a little bit of the data that I alluded to. Thanks for leaving me with the good news. I get to come and deliver good things. So this slide, what you're looking at, is um, a set of test scores from NWEA. It goes by building. It's normative, so we look at data across the country, and these are our scores, much like when you go to the pediatrician and your child is in the 90th percentile for growth. This is how we look at this. Um, we have achievement levels in the green and blue, so 61st and higher, and then we have growth, which is also normed. That means that they, at the top there, I think it says 83, they grew better than 80% of their counterparts across the country. So that's exciting. Uh, this, these, that was math, this is reading. Reading is a slower move. Um, we have a lot of things we've implemented. I expect these to go up um, over the next two years, but again, we're in the yellow and green, so something to be proud of. This is just another look at that data where you can see growth on the top, um, the, nor the normed growth, and then first achievement in the fall and second achievement in the spring. So lots of growth in our K-8. This is looking longitudinally. So in kindergarten, we've seen a growth in reading on the left and a slight decrease in math on the right. Um, that's a 0.4 decrease, so not significant. Again, we're looking at different groups of students, so you have to keep that in mind. Here's first grade. We have growth in reading and math this year, trying to return back to our pre-COVID numbers second grade significant growth and that's a really big deal because that's the learning to read year and the next year is reading to learn here we have increase in both reading and math in third fourth more so in math fifth growth in both grades sixth we have leveled off about the same in reading and a little bit in uh, math. Seventh, an increase in both grades as well as in eighth. And eighth is really cool because you see that trend kind of go up over time. So lots of money and things invested, human resources invested, and it's paying off. Thank you very much, Ms. Stiles. Those colors that she was referencing, just to give you some historical context, in my time, we often celebrated going from yellow to green. I have not often, I've rarely seen blue, and there were uh, multiple instance, incidences where, uh, multiple, multiple cases where we had reached that blue tier, which is really exciting. So. Real quick, PBIS. PBIS stands for Positive Behavior Intervention and Support. Positive Behaviors, Interventions, and Supports. And today we actually had a consultant from Texas, Safe and Civil Schools, who came and provided some training to our administrators. Excited to work with Safe and Civil Schools. That's actually, we've actually worked with Safe and Civil Schools in the past on implementing PBIS. So we're gonna be doing phase two of that implementation and really it's, it's, it's more than just addressing behavior, it's about addressing culture. It's being proactive instead of reactive, it's structuring your classroom, your building, your common areas, it's teaching expectations, it's being systematic in how you observe and gather data about whether or not initiatives are improving behavior, it's interacting positively with students and correcting fluently. It's very systematic, it's very much aligned to MTSS. When you think about MTSS and those tiered supports, more intensive interventions as you move up the triangle, as you will, it's much the same with PBIS. The more intensive behaviors, the more intensive supports. I see Mr. Riekel came uh, with to, to 
join us this evening. I appreciate that. It's fitting. Mr. Riekel and I have been talking about the middle school level in particular as, a, as an area where we're going to target a lot of resources. We're going to be bringing in some expertise uh, in addition to safe and civil schools to address uh, that very concept with PBIS. I think that's so important for early adolescents. That's obviously a challenging year when it comes to social emotional learning behavior and Mr. Riekel is very much on board with systematically improving in that area. So thank you for coming. MTSS again, I won't, I won't belabor the point. I continue to go back to this plan. You've seen this timeline years in the making now multiple times over starting in the winter of 22 with an audit from the Cary team that's University of Minnesota we had the experts come in assess where we needed to grow where we needed to improve put together a list of items that we then incorporated into this plan we're investing money we're we're targeting PD uh, resources at all levels and it's I really do believe having an impact Last slide from me and then I will pivot before sitting back down, but again, addressing the whole child. This is what I would think of as a systematic approach to address to holistic education. Obviously addressing academics, but also all the other factors that impact students learning. Using evidence-based practice, engaging the community, creating a positive culture, and being ultimately addressing uh, addressing students need through equity so at that I'm actually going to transition unless the board has any questions for me transition to a brief facilities update before I turn it over to Mr. Lantman for a budget presentation so anything the board would like to ask from the presentation I, I wouldn't want to ask anything but we did that safe and civil school initiative as you mentioned countywide I'm going to guess probably six years ago, and it will pay off in, in gold coins. It was one of the most effective and, and strategic and thoughtful um, professional developments that, you know, we engaged with them as, a, as an ORISA for three years, I believe, went through a full cycle, and it is wonderful. So that's really, really exciting here for our school district. I'm excited to hear that they're coming back. Yeah, it's all about being clear, uh, explicit about your expectations, teaching them ahead of time, sometimes practicing those expectations, especially with the younger learners, adolescent learners, and, and really uh, avoiding those more intensive interactions where kids maybe aren't aware of what the expectation was and there's that higher level of frustration. So, any other questions before I switch over to facilities? Brief. Uh, two and a half million, roughly two and a half million dollars of projects in the hopper underway. Our HVAC project at Bothwell is essentially completed. We're just finishing up some loose ends, tying up some loose ends. Our boiler burner project at the high school here is underway. That's a significant improvement. Our science labs, you've probably noticed construction down in uh, just, just not far from where I'm standing at this point in time. Again, making good progress. Our radio system is coming along. The infrastructure is in place on Mount Menards. Many of, the, uh, many of the resources are in place. We just need to program radios and get the system up and running. Our outdoor learning pick spaces are in some cases underway. Graverette has already broke ground. Superior Hills is getting ready too soon and then Sandy Knoll will be coming later. And then uh, our security camera project phase two is, I was just emailing back and forth with Chief Bath today and making sure that that particular project is set to get done this summer. So there's a lot of great things going on at Market Area Public Schools. Again, I thank the board. It's exciting for me to drive a narrative about what's happening at MAPS because there are many wonderful things to celebrate. Thank you. Okay, and shifting over to Mr. Lantman. Yeah. 
Uh, good evening, everybody. So I'll be concluding the superintendent's report this evening. Um, I'd like to start with item uh, 6C on the agenda, the 127 plan. So Market Area Public Schools has applied to participate in the state of Michigan's 27K student loan repayment program. Um, that program is a state grant that's designed to uh, reimburse up to $200 per month to uh, eligible employees in order to reimburse that employee through payroll an amount equal to their current loan payment. We don't, uh, we have not been awarded this grant yet. Um, the uh, grant award notifications are expected to come out hopefully by the end of this month. So within the next few days, we might see that. Uh, but in order to facilitate this program, we would need to adopt a Section 127 plan um, uh, under the IRS rules. And what that would do, it, it would give us the ability to exclude up to $5,250 uh, each calendar year uh, uh, tax-free for employees. So it would make this payment essentially non-taxable to the employee under this program. So that's one item that, that uh, we will be uh, recommending you, you adopt that Section 127 plan this evening. And feel free to stop me along the way if, if you have any questions. What are the administrative costs of having that program? Sorry. So the administrative costs, um, if I, we, we've contracted with a company called Fiducius and uh, I don't remember the exact cost off the top of my head, but there is an administrative fee for that. And I think, I think it was maybe one or two hundred a month. I'm not exactly sure what I can I can get that. For all of the employees that will qualify. There, there are currently 26 eligible employees, so we're not talking currently a huge group. Yep. Now the state is looking at opening up potentially to do a second round, so we could maybe have more employees uh, eligible under a, a, a second um, uh, offer. As far as the, the, the dollar cost, I don't have that tucked into my mind at the moment, but I can follow up with the board. I can get you that cost. Most of the administration of this would be on the state level, not on our, we wouldn't be well, doing it all. <laughs> you would think yes. that would be the case. Unfortunately, in, in uh, this situation, um, Michigan Department of Education has put the administration of this on the local districts. And uh, under this 27K program, MDE is not funding administrative costs, uh, either directly or through an indirect uh, reimbursement, cost reimbursement rate. So it's another one of these somewhat of an unfunded mandate. Where so they're, Mr. Lampman, they're, they're, they're you had referenced, on us. You referenced 100 to 200, I'm assuming that's it, dollars. It, yeah, okay. and, 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 and we, we joined under a, a consortium through uh, Market Algerisa. Right. They, they kind of pulled this together, um, brought, uh, brought this third party to the table. So they did the legwork, so that's why, it, it, I'm, I apologize, it's not sticking out in the back of my mind right now as to what that, that exact cost is. But, but it's your understanding that, you. that all the other districts, obviously, this is a state initiative, other districts in RESA would be using that same administrative platforms, Fiducia? Uh, I, I don't know that everybody has, but certainly within market Alger RESA, a significant portion that's of the right. LEAs in the area have gone with, with Fiducia's. Um, uh, and um, it was a it was a by the time you add up the the, the staff time for for a person to sure. to do that in house versus Absolutely. going through a third party, um, you know it was a, a comparable cost. Um, and and I will follow up. I will get you that cost. I I apologize. It's it's just not coming. Uh, to mind at the moment but you're thinking it's under 200 bucks a month for all 27 yeah. it's let not me let me each it's it's let me get cost. let me get back to you on that cost i i apologize it's been a while since i've uh 
looked at, at that agreement, and, and I just, I, I hate to misspeak. Um, I will follow up on that. Um, and uh, this, this, uh, this 120, or I'm sorry, this uh, section 127 plan that, that we are bringing forth is a, uh, was, was developed by True, and, and they vetted this policy, so. Um, Excuse me, th does this program only, is this just for the teachers, or does this cover other staff as well? It, it covers other staff as well. It isn't, it isn't just for teachers. One of, the, one of the caveats is, though, that there um, has to be direct interaction with, with um, students. students. So, um, so there, there are some caveats that come with it. But again, and I'm not trying to put pressure on you. I'm just trying, it looks like we're going to be discussing this for a potential vote. I want to make sure I understand. Oh, absolutely. Right now, you're rough, your best estimate, getting that you are uh, busy with a whole bunch of stuff, including this. Your best estimate is one hundred to two hundred dollars per month, but you don't right now. You can't remember if that's per participant or if that's the overall contract cost for the entire district. Off the top of my head, I can't recall if it was per, per participant or if that was a flat monthly fee for the district. I I, I don't know if it can or can't. No, I I I, I, th I want to say it was it was. It was a monthly fee. Yeah, because yeah. reimbursement is two hundred per. Well, right. Say, I, think yeah, I, I, I think I think I think yeah. it was just a monthly fee, and I yeah. I apologize no, for right. not having I, that. It at the wouldn't tip make of my, sense if we we're doubling yeah. the cost of it. Yeah. Right. That would be my. Yeah. Only it, it was. It was a when we looked at it, it was a pretty insignificant um, cost in uh, in relation to the program overall, and. Um, and I apologize. This is this is one that moved pretty quickly sure, from, know, from MDE's level down to. Yeah. Um, it it did right. move pretty pretty quickly. Um, but I will, I'll follow up with with the details um, on that that cost. Thank you. Any other questions related to the one twenty seven plan? Just so it's a reimbursement of two hundred dollars per month. However, the district may have to pay two hundred dollars per employee. There, there is an administrative cost that MDE is not going to cover, and and I I don't think it's per employee. Um, and if if I said that, I apologize. I, I I think it's a it's a flat. I'll have to go back and review the contract. I apologize. It 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 it, it came fast through Marisa, and. Um, uh, I, I don't have that at my fingertips, so I, I, I would rather get you accurate information you than, than it was speculate. An cost. O overall, when yeah. we looked at the comparison to what it would be to administer that in-house versus um, bringing a third party on board, and is, as there, a, is there a date that we have to make? You know, to we have to complete that contract with again a producer or whatever. I don't want to mispronounce it, but so. <laughs> so right now, yeah, right now we would need the 127 plan in place. Um, if we're if we're awarded, as I understand it, if we're awarded the um, the grant in June, the payments could start as early as July to employees. So this this is moving pretty quickly. So the the the, the piece here that we would need tonight is is having a 127 plan adopted in order for. Um, employees not to be taxed on. So we're just specifically looking at the tax side of it, not the contract at all with? Tonight, currently, yes, that's the case. Got it, thank you. Um, the second thing I, I would like to, uh, to discuss is um, confirming the L4029. So in your packet, you should have um, the annual tax rate request for 2024. And what this is, is just a, um, a con an annual uh, confirmation of, of what the district is going to be levying on the tax roll. So we have three voted millages, one for operations, one for sinking fund, and one for debt service. Um, which is a bond that was taken out in 2016 for the athletic field. So we're going to be uh, 
living 18 mills for operations on non-homestead property, 0.934 mills on uh, the millage for the sinking fund, and 0.38 mills to cover the debt payment on the uh, athletic field bond. And the, uh, the tax rate request uh, does get reviewed annually by our bond advisors, PFM, as well as True. Um, so this has already been vetted by those two organizations. So we're just looking for confirmation um, uh, uh, tonight. Any questions before I move on? Very good. Okay, and seven and eight, we are going to be combining this evening. So we're gonna be discussing the 2023-24 final budget amendment and the 24-25 proposed original budget. Uh, the 2425 budget is um, uh, somewhat of uh, somewhat the same as 2324. Um, we didn't have any programming changes, as Mr. Sedgwick indicated. Uh, we're continuing with summer school. We still have before and after school uh, tutoring in this budget, so we haven't made any program changes from prior years. So I think that's important to note that. We're trying to maintain um, the pieces that were put in place during COVID uh, for, for as long as we, we can sustain those. So as I just mentioned with the L4029, um, these are the millages that we currently levy. We have 18 mills in uh, operations for non-homestead properties. We levy six mills for commercial personal property. We're levying 0.934 mills for our sinking fund and 0.38 mills for our uh, debt service. And you can see how that compares to prior years, slight changes from year to year. Uh, enrollment projections. So one thing that the board had requested last year was um, a comparison of what prior um, projections were against actual uh, enrollment numbers. So that's what you see on this um, uh, uh, slide. So for 23-24, um, we had projected uh, 3,180 uh, students for our uh, FTE enrollment for 23-24, um, we came in at 3202. So it came in higher than projections. Um, we, uh, we use a third party to uh, estimate, and, and not only maps, there, there are several districts, lots of districts actually that use this third party to project enrollment. And we usually go off the most likely projection um, blended with the lowest projection to kind of come up with a blended rate. When we look at um, where we've been and we look at where we're going, um, we felt comfortable this year in, in using 3,202 again, um, looking at the students that graduated versus the incoming uh, kindergarten class, somewhat balanced out, so we felt we were, we were gonna leave that on par. Looking to the future, um, if we use the, um, the blended projections, you know, it, it starts to dip, dip down moving forward. Um, a couple of things that have been mentioned uh, by Mr. Sedgwick in the past, you know, we are receiving some school of choice students from, uh, I believe, the Gwynn area. Um, and so we, you know, even though our birth rates are down, we're, we're seeing large, larger kindergarten classes uh, the last couple of years. State aid, so another significant factor in, in um, our revenue is state aid. So we receive a dollar value per pupil from the state of Michigan to fund our operation. Uh, for 23-24, that number was $9,608 per pupil. 
looking out into 24-25, um, we are uh, estimating $9,849 per pupil. Um, and that came from the governor's recommendation in the budget. The House was at 9825 the Senate was at 9910 in discussions that we had with some others. Um, we kind of felt at this point that the uh, governor's proposal was, was probably where it sounded like it was, it was heading. So that was our estimate for the 24-25 budget. Looking at the general fund, um, the general fund's comprised of multiple funds, including our general operations, our grants fund, Kaufman, Planetarium, Father Marquette, um, Athletics. And, and again, please feel free to stop me along the way. I'm, I know it's going to be a long meeting. I'm trying to keep a brisk pace. If I'm going too fast, slow me down, but I can also talk so feel free to speed me up if you need me to yeah, look at state aid and, I, and kind of figure in inflation and see how the real growth state aid is and uh, you know i'm i'm i have not since i've been here um it's something we could look at and i'm sure somebody has that data available too um, I'm curious because it shows a it shows a pretty steep rise but it also it was during a period with some pronounced inflation it, it, it is yeah, and, and you know, I think one of the other things to keep in mind, uh, Mr. Sarka, is um, there were years where there were no increases or nominal increases to state aid, even through some inflationary periods where, where education just wasn't funded. And I think COVID kind of shed a light on the underfunding of education and the needs that, that exist. And so the last, the last few years, we've, we've been seeing um, that come through the the state's budget yeah how long this lasts it's hard to say i'm sure at some point there will be a change in administration or a change in priorities at the state level but currently they're you know they they've been funding um education and that's 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 wonderful to see um tax revenues i'm sure everybody got uh, a statement from your assessor back in february and indicating what your um, newest uh, state assessed value was, your taxable value. Um, the state it, uh, taxes go up on a, an inflationary factor each year, the lesser of 5% uh, uh, or inflation. Unfortunately, I believe this is the second year in a row that it's going up um, by the maximum inflationary factor of 5%. Um, other local revenues we based off prior year um, historicals, state revenues I, I just mentioned we we estimated at 9,849 per pupil. Um, another factor is our MIPSERS rate, uh, which is currently at 16.89 percent for our UAL stabilization. I was just checking today the the new number is not yet available on on MIPSERS website. It's usually out in June, but. I think there have been some delays at the state level, so we ran with a 17% estimate, which I feel is reasonable. Federal re revenues, um, based off, we based that off our preliminary allocations that we, we saw for um, largely our title programs and Medicaid, and all other revenues were based off prior year historicals. So looking at our general fund revenues, So we're looking at um, overall revenues for 23-24 of 48,240,000. Looking to 24-25, uh, we're estimating currently 48,092,000. Uh, some of those changes uh, for 23-24, we've exhausted our um, ESSER COVID money that we received during the pandemic. We had about 175,000 left to spend in 23-24 that we exhausted. Um, so looking to 24-25 for our federal revenues, it's really, it comes down to our title programs, our Title I, Title II, Title IV, or Title VI, our flow through our Perkins. Um, so kind of, kind of more of a historically what you'd see in, in federal revenues prior to COVID. Um, the state revenues, we're, we're estimating slightly down. That's due to some of the state grants that we've had um, going away, 
R31-0 um, that um, provided uh, uh, some additional mental health uh, uh, support for additional mental health workers um, has dried up. Uh, some of our safety dollars um, we have been utilized. So we're starting to see some of the state grants dry up, although we are expecting to some more state grants to come through next year in 24, 25. There's, there's been some word about other state um, opportunities down the line. And we've been surprised, you know, mid-year, the last couple of years with, with grant opportunities that we weren't expecting. Um, pie chart, um, you can see that our biggest share of the budget is the blue, which is our uh, state revenue. Um, that's followed up by the, the pinkish color, um, taxes, local taxes, the, the deeper purple, um, that's our, our special ed funding that comes through um, our uh, local RESA. And then the less significant is, is um, the federal portion and the remaining local shares. Um, but you can see this, you know, largely our funding comes through the, the state. Uh, looking on the expenditure side for the general fund, um, currently our bargaining agreements are all set to expire on June 30. We are in negotiations. We do not currently have settled um, uh, agreements with, with any of our bargaining units currently. Looking at health insurance, our hard cap rates are estimated to go up about 0.2% over 23-24 based off of um, uh, the state's uh, established hard caps. We already talked about the MIPSERS rates. Um, you know, one of the things, as I mentioned, um, no programming changes for um, uh, from 23-24 for the 24-25 year. Uh, one thing that we're committed to, though, is, is continuing to invest in new school buses. So we do have two buses in, in the budget for 24-25. Um, uh, you know, I think we've replaced about 45% of the bus fleet my time here at MAPS, so that's been pretty a pretty significant investment. And uh, so it's it's time that we now kind of stretch these purchases out a bit. So we're gonna we're gonna target two buses per year, and then all other expenditures are based off historical trends. Um, this is just a breakdown by by function. We're looking at 46.3 million um, for 23-24, 47.7 million for 24-25, and um, this is probably the better one to look at. Object uh, looking at the data by object is probably a little little better than function. So you can see our salaries break down, our benefits break down purchase services. Um, capital outlay, we spent about 1.2 million in 23-24. Looking at 24-25, um, we're, we're uh, taking that down a little bit. Some of the things that we had in 23-24, we had made three bus purchases. We had um, a significant portion of the radio bus radio system paid out of capital outlay in 23-24. Um, uh, we had an ECF grant for Chromebook purchases that was about 72000 So some of those purchases are going away, and, and, um, and so we brought that cost down for capital outlay in 24-25, where it's going to be the, um, uh, the PA system. And some of the things that Mr. Sedgwick had talked about, PA system, um, we're looking at uh, potentially other safety features like protective film for windows and, and as I mentioned, buses. Um, transfers, um, we're recommending um, a transfer to capital projects of 1,150,000 for 23-24. We're also recommending that for 24-25 as well. Um, in, uh, which would be a million dollars in addition to the 150,000 that we normally transfer over for the um, for the one-to-one uh, -one, uh, Chromebook program. So again, overall, we're looking at 46.3 million for 23-24 and 47.7 million for 24-25.
And again, um, just a pie graph of that breakdown. You can see combined salaries and benefits is the largest component of our general fund, 81% um, of, of, of the general fund budget is, is salaries and benefits, leaving 19% of the budget to fund all the other general operations. And I'm spending a lot of, you know, the general fund's obviously the biggest. I'm spending a lot of time on the general fund. We'll, we'll speed this up as we go along. Um, so overall, looking at the general fund, uh, we're looking at revenues for 23-24 of 48.2 million, expenses of 46.3 million, um, resulting in um, an overall fund balance of about 17.5 million for 23-24, and that gets broken down into several categories, uh, non-spendable items, restricted items. Um, we have 4.6 million committed for contingency. We've also left the 1.3 million um, uh, assigned for MTSS implementation. Currently, as Mr. Sedgwick said, we have uh, six and a half instructional coaches We've been funding those currently out of additional uh, at-risk dollars that the district has been receiving, but again, we don't know how long we'll be um, uh, collecting that additional um, at-risk money, so we feel it's important to keep the, the um, money set aside for uh, funding MTSS in the future as, as other grants um, uh, might pull back and dry up. And then um, again, uh, 881,000 set aside for uh, future school bus purchases as well, leaving uh, 10.484 million um, unassigned and available for use for 23-24. And a similar, pretty much a similar uh, case for 24-25, where we would have 10 million 710,000 uh, available for use. Food service fund. Uh, by all indications, I think we're gonna have another universal food service program for 24-25. I believe it was in the House, Senate, and Governor's budgets. Uh, so that's a pretty good indication that we'll see another program. Um, so we've, we've more or less left the food service um, revenues intact based off of where we think another year will be under a universal program. Food service expenditures uh, for 23-24, we were at a little over $2 million. Um, we anticipate that's where we'll be coming into year end. Um, we did have some significant purchases during the 23-24 year. As you may recall, we. Um, the, the board approved the purchase of a, milk, uh, a food truck. We invest in new milk coolers. Um, the board had approved the purchase of a combi oven. Um, so we've been rolling money back into the program. Um, like, uh, I believe there were 500, I wanna say roughly 500 other districts in the state that because of the Universal Meals Program, they wound up building up a fund balance in their, their food service funds and um, so we've been under a, a spend down plan. Um, there's, a, there's a formula that, um, that uh, we need to abide by. Um, we, can't, we can't build up too large of a fund balance. So we've been spending that down, trying to hit our target of about 450,000. And we've been working with MDE on this process and they've, they've, they've been wonderful to work through it with. Um, so we're looking at a uh, net loss overall of about 199,000 in 23-24, sorry. And again, that was intentional by design. Same thing with 24-25, we're looking at a spend down of 50,000 um, by design. So looking at our equity in the food service fund, again, our goal is to get down to, um, you know, the 400, top end of the 450,000 range. Um, this, this budget gets us currently uh, at the end of 24, 25, down to 468,000. As we get into the year and we, we know our costs a little bit more, we'll take a look at this and, and we'll probably do some adjustments with a future 
budget amendment um, where we try to bring this a, a little closer to that target that we want to be at. Um, uh, Mr. Collins, our food service director, has some ideas about what, what we could do this year. Moving on to the debt service fund. Um, again, we have one bond out there that was taken out in 2016 to cover the athletic field. We levy a millage to make that annual payment. Um, and that's what this is, just the estimated tax revenues that will be collected um, and the uh, uh, principal and interest on the bond payment. So um, nothing really significant changing here. We're, we're looking at, um, you know, Roughly close to 700,000 in revenue both years, you know, 650, 660,000 in bond payments overall. Moving on to the summary, looking at the um, um, beginning and ending equity, uh, we're looking at um, an ending fund balance in the debt service fund of about 251,000 this year, about 281,000 next year. And again, this is just to cover our our um, bond payments. Moving on to the capital projects fund. So capital projects, um, local revenue is about 150,000 in capital projects. As I stated before, we're looking at transferring in about 1.15 million um, this year and next. Um, expenditures, 23-24, roughly 100,000. Um, uh, looking at a net uh, income of uh, 1.2 million for 23-24. Looking out into next year, um, we have uh, about 271,000 in expenditures out of the capital projects fund next year. Um, as Mr. Sedgwick stated earlier, um, we are breaking ground on our um, outdoor <coughs> learning spaces and um, we, we are still looking into grant opportunities for those, but in the meantime, we, we have a placeholder here uh, in our capital projects fund. So we're looking at an overall net income of 1029000 uh, in the 2024-25 budget. And then overall, looking at our fund balance, so we're targeting an ending fund balance of five, uh, just under 5.5 5 million in capital projects this year and 6.5 billion at the end of uh, 24, 25. Um, you know, and again, I, I, I do wanna say what, what is significant here is um, our, our the sinking fund millage takes in a uh, little over a million dollars or 1.1 million a year, give or take. And you know, we, we have about, you know, close to 100 million in identified needs, infrastructure needs in the district. So the sinking fund alone um, is, isn't going to take care of all the, all the needs that we have in the district. And I'm, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but um, I'll, I, I just, I'll throw that out there and, and say that, you know, um, ha having a, a healthy capital projects fund to be a backstop in an emergency situation when the sinking fund can't handle um, all the needs. And, and we've, we've run across some emergency situations um, is, you know, <laughs> during my time here. There's a sinkhole I'm thinking of at Bothwell and a sewer issue, at, uh, a stormwater issue at Superior Hills and the entryway at Gray Barrette wasn't on our list. And um, we, we all know about the drilling on the elevator. Um, so, so uh, yeah, uh, again, I'm preaching to the converted, I suppose. Um, too far sinking fund so my spiel goes right into the sinking fund um, so again uh, we're collecting uh, about 1.3 million 1.2 million in taxes in the sinking fund um, for 23-24 with all the projects mr. Sedgwick had, had, had named and, and um, myself the elevator project um, the entryways are graver at some of the other things that popped up we're anticipating having spent about 1.7 million in 23-24, and we're looking currently at spending another 1.5 million in 24-25.
The big project there, as Mr. Sedgwick had indicated, is a science lab project. Um, we're also doing the CTE roof over at the high school. They, I noticed they started today. Um, um, you know, I think that's in excess of 417,000 just for the CTE roof. Um, so again, again um, you know, expensive projects, but necessary to uh, maintain the integrity of the buildings. So looking at the sinking fund, uh, we're anticipating an ending fund balance of 785,000 at the end of 23-24, looking into 24-25 after we complete um, the science lab project, the CT roof, and a couple other smaller projects out there. We're looking at about 480,000 in, in ending fund balance. Um, so with the sinking fund, in order to do a significant project, you know, and certainly in excess of a million dollars, generally we have to save up a little bit and and try to let the fund build up enough to cover a, a major project. Um, and then just our, our private purpose trust, um, we're looking at um, beginning fund balance of 305,000 this year, uh, revenues um, from interest and donations of 98,000, um, we had about 115,000 in scholarships this year, uh, resulting in a net loss of $16,760 and um, ending fund balance of 288,000. Looking at 24-25, um, similar case, 288,000 we're anticipating in uh, beginning re uh, equity, 99,000 in uh, revenue, 115,000 estimated scholarships. So ending ending fund balance in that fund of 272,000. Any? No, I'm just. What? Oh, okay. Was a wing wing last I just time. had one footnote, uh, Mr. Lamon, just because I don't know if anybody else would be paying attention to it or be concerned about it, but you had mentioned the um, the bond from 2016 for the athletic field, uh, just for the public in case they didn't remember, but that covered Kaufman Auditorium upgrades, the athletic field. Um, MSHS Auxiliary Gym, Cherry Creek Edition, Spirit Hills Edition, and the Maker Space. Two years. I just didn't want that to be. No, no, thank only thought you. about is the uh, field. So. No, thank, thank you. That that is important. You're right. It did cover more than just the athletic field, and I appreciate your your clarification on that. Um, I, I sometimes just find it easier to narrow it down to one focus when I mentioned the bond, but you're right, it did cover a myriad of uh, other other topics. Yep, thanks. Thank you. Okay, hearing no other questions, I wrap it up, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, that's a lot of work, thank you. Okay. Um, Oh, that, sorry. That's all I have. Okay. Sorry. No, you're fine. So, uh, do we need to consider amendment to the 2023-2024 budget? Um, since we all do all together, I think we have the comments from the public first, and then we consider that amendment, okay. and then Sounds move good. on uh, in the agenda. Sounds good. I just wanted to get clarification there. Um, so, regarding the budget, public comment, uh, Margaret Brum. Good evening, Margaret Brum, 404 East Magnetic Street, Marquette, Michigan. Uh, I have several comments about the budget as presented. Um, would it be possible for the uh, background information that led to the slides being prepared to be posted on the uh, school board website for review by the public? Um, this would be the basically the documents that were used to create the overall uh, summary slides we just saw. In addition, would it be possible to have the summary slides themselves be posted on the website for 
inclusion. I understand they'll be with the minutes, but I, I also understand the minutes won't be approved until the next meeting, which will be several weeks from now. So those are, are the two requests of just about the housekeeping of, of having a, a, a budget process. I also uh, was expecting and did not see uh, a line item relating to the rebranding. As I understand it, it was not part of this year's budget because it was predicted that the rebranding would not cost the school any money. I, in the past year, I've been in this room enough to hear that there was at least a $40,000 expenditure attributed to the rebranding. And I would be interested in finding out where that money, I want to say came from, but I, I mean, I'm sure you have some sort of uh, general fund that you tap into that. Uh, but also that the, uh, the ongoing rebranding would be documented somewhere in those supporting documents for the summary of what happened in the last year. Uh, I realize these are different requests, but um, it's hard as a member of the public to understand a budget unless you can see the original documents and uh, the, the, the catch about what, what was happening in a prior project uh, related to someone's memory being presented without it, the slides uh, had a summary with, with some things missing. There's no, there's no pejorative in those things being missing. It's just if you don't have the original information, you really can't catch up to speed. Um, also, um, one thing missing, and I understand attorney-client privilege. I understand the board is entitled to hire counsel as is necessary, but I would be um, interested in how much the board spends on their various counsels. And this is because um, in recent public communications in another forum, it was uh, suggested by a member of this board that some of the actions that I've taken in the last, I want to say six months, have caused undue expenditures to this board. And I would be very much interested in the documentation of what expenditures are being attributed to actions I take in, in what way. Uh, for example, uh, there has been in the last six months a public hiring of a trademark attorney for your board. I've been in contact with this gentleman who indicated he, had, he did not charge the board either for filing the trademark applications, the money themselves, or for his work. So I'm, I'm curious as to the documentation of, of the statement behind somehow what I was doing was costing the board money. Also, uh, there's an ongoing issue with the Petoskey Law Firm having to do with uh, a professional service relating to the embezzlement. I only have one month's worth of invoice that mentioned that. I haven't yet received the next two, but I would be um, interested to see if that is going to be an ongoing expenditure or if it's a one-time deal. And again, I'm not asking for attorney-client privileged information. I understand the board has a right to seek legal counsel. But I don't think it's unreasonable to make a list of the legal counsel that the board has sought counsel from and the amount of money that has been paid to that counsel. I, I don't think that's breaching attorney-client privilege. And so I request that that information be provided to the public. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so I guess I would consider an amendment to the 2023-2024 budget. Make a motion to adopt the most recent uh, budget amendment for the 2023-2024 budget. Support. Uh, motion made by Mr. Hewitt, support by Mrs. Maddox-Smith. Right? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, any further comments on the 2023-2024 budget? Okay. I just wanted, what, real quick, I just wanted to, um, again, thank Mr. Lantman. Um, this is a big elephant uh, to look at and uh, holistically, and the, um, it seems like an increase of smaller updates throughout, um, oh, I don't know, maybe the last year, year and a half. It just, at least for somebody who thinks the way I do, it allows me to, when we get to these, you know, two points in the year, to look at the whole thing and kind of um, just see it 
uh, holistically as opposed to one big blast. I really appreciate that. And it does not go without noticing that this is an extraordinary amount of work. I understand that. Thank you. Okay. Um, any further comments? All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. I think we're on to the consent agenda now. Yeah, okay. Double check in here. All right, so I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda, which Big includes. Motion. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, that includes the minutes of the regular board meeting of May 20, 2024, the personnel report dated June 2024, and the financial reports of May 2024. Would make a motion to approve the entire consent agenda. So I'll second. Approved. <laughs> All right, I think I'm going to go with a uh, motion made by Mr. Zendidnik, support by Mr. Sarka. Sorry. Um, any further comments? Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion, any opposed? Motion passes. Uh, moving on to comments from the public. Um, Ms. Brum? Margaret Brum, 404 East Magnetic Street. Uh, the first thing I have to do has to do with a local event, which is of interest to anyone um, in the schools, anyone who is dealing with public funding. And the second thing I have is a question for the board. Um, this Friday night here in town at the Marquette Township Community Hall, I think it starts for the public at 6, though the attendees are supposed to be there at 5, is what's uh, the League of Women Voters Forum for the candidates for the 109th House District seat. There's a primary election next month, I believe it's August 6th, and this League of Women Voters Forum, um, I can't say enough good things about them. I participated in them in the past, I've also watched them, and for two hours, you sit at a table with all the other people who are running for the same job you're running for, and you all have, you all ask the same questions and you go in a row and you don't know if you're gonna be first this time or second or third, so you don't really, there's really no advantage. Sometimes you wanna be first and sometimes you're last, but either way, I'm um, asking that as many of the board members who can attend will attend. Uh, this year, for the first time, it's gonna be televised, I believe on channel three. It's also gonna be part of the live stream for the League of Women Voters, and it's gonna be filmed. Uh, the last, last time they had one, it was in um, Kaufman, and there was a difficulty with the sound system. So this, I think that may be one of the reasons they went to the Township Hall, which has an excellent sound system. But it, yes, this is a commercial for that forum for everybody who um, is interested in the pr proceeding. We have a, uh, a vibrant list of candidates. We have three on the Democratic side and three on the Republican side. And if you uh, put all the people on the planet into a room and shook out six separate people, I don't think you could come up with six more different people and I've had the privilege of meeting with these people and discussing things with them as well, but after the end of the meeting, you'll have a very good idea of how people responded, what was most important, what was least important, what they were familiar with, what their goals were. And I cannot say, as a candidate and as a citizen of the city of Marquette, I really recommend to people, as much as I want everybody to vote, please wait until after this forum, because at the end of the forum, you'll have seen everybody tested in an environment, um, and I have a great deal of respect, but those League of Women voter ladies have, are very tough. They just, it's, it's nothing to do with personality, you're not allowed to use names or anything like that, it's just answer the question. So that's my commercial for the League of Women Voters. It will be televised, it will be online, but there's plenty of room in the town hall, and I know it's a Friday night and people have a lot to do, but I, I've been looking forward to it ever since they announced it. The absentee ballots are available to pick up this week. They'll be mailed at the end of the week, and we're gonna have early voting as well. So this is, uh, it's not just an abstract thing. It used to be you waited until a week before the election to pay attention, and now, as a candidate, you've been doing more than that. Now, in the course of my preparation for this um, meeting, I've had many different conversations with many different people about 
what's the most important issue? What's the most important issue? Uh, from my perspective, it's documenting how much money we send down to Lansing and how much we get back, not just for our schools, but for every public service we pro they provide for us. Because it seems to me that a lot of the money we send down state never gets back beyond the bridge. But in the course of discussing things with people, I talked to various union representatives, and I was asked to bring this to the board's attention. I do not expect an answer, but it was, it was told to me that the support staff here in the Marquette school system is generally regarded as one of the lowest reimbursed support staff in the Upper Peninsula. I don't know if that's true or not. I mean, I, I obviously the person speaking to me was speaking quickly and with certainty. But I would uh, request that one of you, all of you, somebody, look into that and comment on that because you're doing budgets for next year. And it just seemed like if that were even partially true, that would be something that could and should be um, addressed. And I wanted to bring that to your attention um, because I don't know a better way of bringing it to your attention than to stand here and just say it to you. So that was the only comment that I got that was directly related to the school system. And again, um, this Friday night, 6 o'clock, Marquette Township Community Hall, parking is free, entrance is free. It's completely nonpartisan. You don't have to register. You don't have to show a voter's ID. You just walk in, sit down, and listen. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, moving on to new business, um, consider adoption of the 2024-2025 budget resolution. I'll make the motion to adopt the 2024-2025 budget as presented. Support. Okay, uh, motion made by Mr. Hewitt, support by Ms. Ray. Uh, any further comments? Hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Um, consider approval of the 2024-2025 MHSAA membership resolution. So that's the Michigan High School Athletic Association. This is something that we do every year. Make motion to consider the adoption of the MHSAA membership resolution. Second. Uh, motion made by Mr. Zadunik, support by Mrs. Clip. Any further comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Um, consider adoption of the 127 plan. So again, just for clarification before a motion is made, uh, Mr. Lightman, um, just to reiterate what was said earlier, what we're doing right now with this vote would be voting to establish the proper IRS uh, tax designation in order for that to happen. It doesn't have anything to do with necessarily going with the, the, the contract or the vendor, et cetera, right? Correct. Correct, yes. We're, we're just establishing a plan under IRS code, uh, section 127. Um, adopting that, by adopting that um, 127 plan, it means that um, if we're awarded this grant fund through the state, those payments can be made um, to the employee uh, tax-free up to $5,250, I believe the number was. Um, and, and the district's just going to be acting as a pass-through for the state uh, un, under this grant program. Okay. <laughs> we'll provide that. The information regarding the administrative costs before we make any decisions on participating. I, I, yeah. I, I, yes. So I'll make a motion to adopt the uh, we just need to adopt. Yeah. formation of the 127 plan for the district. Support. Second. All right, motion made by Mr. Hewitt, support by Mr. Zarka, unless that someone else won the rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> um, any further comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Consider approval of the L-4029. I believe that was the tax rate. Millage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I'm just going to keep on going. Yeah, I'll make let's another do motion it. to approve the uh, 2024 tax rate request L4029. Second. Oh. Mr. <laughs> Clark. Uh, motion made by Mr. Hewitt, support by Mr. Zadunik. Any further comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Um, set board meeting dates for the remainder of 2024. Um, they are in your packet. So because of the holidays in July and September, we will be only having one meeting in July and one meeting in September. So I would entertain a motion to set the meeting dates for the remainder of 2024. I'll make a motion to set the, or accept the board meeting dates for the remainder of 2024. Support. All right, uh, motion made by Ms. Gray, support by Mr. Hewitt. Any further comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Um, designate depositories for school funds uh, pursuant of MCL uh, 380.1221 to Incredible Bank Primary Michigan Liquid Asset Fund, U.S. Bank, Fifth Third Bank, Flagstar Bank, Honor Credit Union, Nicolay National Bank, and Range Bank. I'll make a motion. I will make. Well, I will make a motion to designate the depositories depositories for the Michigan funds under MCL three eight zero dot one two two one at the following um, banks and institutions. Support. Okay. Motion made by Mrs. Clip. Support by Mr. Hewitt. Any further comments? Is this something that gets shopped around as far as? The deposit interest rates are those looked at as far as just conversations with the different banks and credit unions locally uh, we, we have had conversations um, uh, recently um, I believe the last time that uh, the district has um, uh, put out an RFP on the banking services was about three years ago if I'm not mistaken um, so it, it's something that we've discussed uh, doing another RFP soon so um, but yes yes we we're you know we we are open to, to getting the best service and the best rates um, within the community so and we've talked about this in the past but I think it it's worth explaining again because I think somebody dropping in on a conversation will let's ask why we're going with so many banks um, you like to have well a couple of reasons you like to have um, not all your eggs in one basket, if I could say that simply, uh, number one. Um, two, we like to have some flexibility. Um, three, uh, to the point earlier, it also, um, you, you know, we are a local unit of government, so um, uh, having the availability to work with, with other stakeholders in the community is a good thing. Um, and, and having those business relationships um, is important uh, for a local unit of government. Um, and you know, but again, um, periodically it's good to shop around for um, you know the best fees, best rates. So um, uh, I, I would I would say that would be the my main reasons. Yeah, I would just encourage if it's been a few years. I'm not sure what the average RFP duration has been between those, but it would be something to uh, take a look at. At some point, when you know, when when you have time, so <laughs> yeah. cer certainly. And 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 Mr. Zunik, we've already we've had have had those conversations already. Um, so yeah, thank you. Any further comments? Okay, so we have motion and support. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Uh, moving on to board member comments. We'll start with uh, Mr. Zadunik. 
No additional comments. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Maddox Smith. Um, I just want to thank Mr. Lampman for all the work. And I have to agree with Ms. Clip, you know, um, getting the updates throughout the year helps us really understand to di and disseminate this just plethora of information. It's, it's a lot. So thank you very much for all the time that you've put into that and helping us understand that and the public understand that. It's amazing. Um, just want to thank everybody for their hard work. And, um, and I wanted to just um, speak real quickly. We had a couple of letters from some students and um, one addressed to me in particular about mental health and I just want those students to know that uh, those letters are read and, and we are looking at and thinking about mental health and homework. <laughs> um, but the letters were well written, um, evidence-based research on mental health statistics. One in 17 struggle with mental health and you know that's, that's over two million students. You know we really have to um, keep that in our in our rear view mirror and uh, keep that the priority. So I wanted to reach out and just thank those students. Um, I think it was Hannah Holman and Kylie Emblad. Um, also, um, Ms. Duran, Emma Durand, and uh, Danja Hill. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Ray? Um, well, I think it's uh, impressive that the board received that honor from the League of Women Voters. They're an impressive group of people, and um, the way this board functions, and I give you a lot of credit of bringing you know, the meeting of the whole to the table, Kristen, and um, just the increased communication um, since you've been president, as well as the transparency in it through process, as well as through these meetings has been really a pleasure to be a part of and to see that shift within the board. And I've heard that from a number of the League of Women Voters who I didn't know prior, but coming to me and saying, hey, I've been watching you all. This is impressive. So um, I think kudos to you and kudos to the entire board. Uh, also, it's just great to hear about MTSS again. It's been a little while and to see those you know, changes happening post COVID. Um, is a really good feeling and the fact that we're looking at the whole child and I also love the fact that we're incorporating this concept of creating a culture which um, we all know when you walk into a place you can feel that culture and um, it just is what will make a child smile when they walk into a building is knowing that culture is there and feeling it um, so I, I'm eager to kind of be hearing more and more about this PBIS and so forth. Um, also, just the budgets. We all know that this is the very dry, boring meeting, and I appreciate everybody coming out for this and paying attention and listening to the budget because, uh, you know, it's not always the fun part, but it's very critical and important, and I appreciate all your work on that. Jim, thank you. Mrs. Clip. Echoing back again, third time now to Mr. Rantman, so appreciated. Uh, I love the fact that you use so many different modalities to help uh, us understand all these numbers and how they work. Um, the people in this room who know me best know that my passion is in instruction and curriculum. And so um, I just, I, I wanna save it civil, I already said it, super excited. Culture is what drives communities. Culture is what drives learning the data is very clear. When kids walk into spaces, they are either seen and heard or they're not. And if they are not seen or heard, they're not able to learn at the same um, rate and with the same success as kids um, who are seen and heard. So, but uh, really from the bottom of my heart, Ms. Stiles, uh, thank you for your hard work. I know this is difficult, uh, and specifically because you're the conduit to this. Those teachers in the field are um, the ones that are creating the changes. Uh, we know, those of us in education, that because everyone has gone through public education, or most people have, everyone kind of feels like they know how it works. But we know, uh, and you know, and are bringing a highlight to it, uh, the science. Uh, the art and the craft of good instruction and the intentionality and the thoughtfulness and that is all brokered through 
those teachers who service our kids in the field. And the fact that the scores are doing what they're doing does not surprise me in the least because of your intentionality, uh, the intentionality of Superintendent Sedwick, and uh, the ex just exemplary educators we have in our community who are dialing it in with kids. So thank you to your hard work. Thank you to your hard work. That stuff just gets me very, very excited. Thank you so much. Mr. Hewlett. Can't say it better than that. Uh, no other comments. Mr. Sarka. Thank you. It's re really, well, I just turned it off. Look at that. <laughs> it's really an honor, the, the, the work for the League of Women Voters. And I understand that, you know, there's been somebody from the League at every one of our meetings kind of holding our feet to the fire, making sure that we're doing uh, our job. And, and that is a critical part of what they do. The uh, ceremony was a w wonderful ceremony. And, and uh, re really something to be a part of. I want to make sure we get this award also to our students uh, who, who also participated on the board this last year, and I think that's being done. Uh, I just was, no, I was looking out, uh, outside uh, quite a bit at that tree, and I think what a great symbol of kind of what we do as a school district. That tree was planted about the year I was born. So I looked at it grow, I think, when I was here in high school, and Shelly, I think, when you were here in high school, I don't think that tree was even up to this window. And look at how big it is. And it gets protection from the whole building and input from all the people in the building. And it's kind of a good example of kind of what we do as a community of raising up our students. And, uh, it's pretty impressive. I don't know how much longer it's got to grow, but uh, pretty impressive. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving on to board president comments. Um, I'd just like to echo what the rest of my board said regarding the budget and and yes thanking the league of women voters for for coming and for nominating us um i just want to say that you know i've been on the board this is year 10 for mr hewitt and i and i just want to thank everyone on the board for for your hard work um i mean this is the 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 best board that i've ever been on um I just appreciate all of you. So, thank you. Uh, moving on to announcements and other meetings. Um, since the calendar has been approved, our next meeting will be July 15th um, in the Little Theater at 5.30. Um, we're changing it to the Little Theater because it actually has air conditioning. <laughs> so, I mean, it's not bad in here right now, but it's, it's well, I see a few red faces out there, but <laughs> historically this isn't that bad, but it'll be a lot, lot more comfortable in the Little Theater. So that'll be uh, July 15th at 5.30 in the Little Theater. Um, and the first day of school is going to be September 3rd, 2024. Oof. All right. So I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All right, motion made by Mr. Hewitt, supported by Mr. Zudnik. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Yes. Oh, boy. Motion still passes. <laughs> like it does nice every time. single meeting.